Okay, everybody, we can go ahead and start. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to The Secret Chemistry of Beer, uh, this online learning event. I'm really excited to have you all here. Uh, my name is Eric Jelm. I work with the UO Alumni Association, uh, where we strive to connect Duck alumni to each other and to their alma mater. And we are so glad that you could be joining us today for this live streaming webinar to learn more about the chemistry that makes your favorite brew from one of the UO's expert faculty members. So before we hear from Jim Hutchinson and his panel, I want to point out that this webinar is one of the many online ways for ducks to connect with one another and with the school that we all love in the coming weeks and months. Uh, if the University of Oregon has your contact information, you should have received a few issues of our Duck Nest, Nest newsletter already. Uh, those are sent every Thursday and they highlight activities and resources available to you uh, during this pandemic, whether they're webinars like these, uh, online networking opportunities, or stories about how the duck community is banding together. So even though we're keeping distance to save lives during this time, there's no need for us to be isolated. Uh, if you are interested in viewing a full list of upcoming events, you can visit uoalumni.com backslash duck nest uh, and some quick housekeeping before we start. If everybody could go ahead and make sure to mute their audio and turn off your video camera during the presentation, that would be great. Uh, that'll make sure that dis presenters aren't distracted and our other attendees are not distracted. Um, in addition to that, I'm sure that Jim and our panel will be sparking your curiosity during this uh, presentation. So if you do have questions, answer them or submit them into the chat field and we'll be answering questions both during the presentation uh, and then we'll have time for Q&A at the end as well. And lastly, if you do have uh, beers that you wanna to plan to taste along with our panel, now would be a great time to pour them and get everything ready. So enough of that housekeeping, enough of me talking, let's introduce Jim and our panel uh, and then you can hear about the presentation and learn about the chemistry of beer. So Professor Jim Hutchinson is the Senior Associate Vice President for the UO's new Phil and Penny Knight Campus for Accelerating Scientific Impact. He is the Loki Harrington Chair in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, and he is a member of the UO's Material Science Institute. We are all excited tonight to learn from Professor Hutchinson and his panel uh, about the chemistry behind our favorite beers. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Jim Hutchinson. Well, Eric, thanks so much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I, it's a, it's, it's a, uh, would be awesome if we were all in a big pub together, uh, but this has got to be the next best thing. And to help make it better, I have a fantastic uh, group of alumni as part of my panel that are going to help us tonight uh, make this a bit more experiential. Um, Betsy Tannenbaum, who got her master's in 2008 in arts management is joining us. Betsy is the alumni network manager for the Knight Campus um, and a beer connoisseur. Um, Mark Blaine uh, got his uh, master's in literary nonfiction writing in 2000. He's currently the associate director for the Center for Science Communication Research in our uh, School of Journalism and Communication. And Dana Garvis is a, a graduate from the chemistry department. Uh, she got her bachelor's in 2010 um, after a variety of different paths in the beer industry. She founded her own company, um, Oregon Brew Lab, and she's a professional beer judge. So um, we have a, they're just, it's just such a great panel. I hope you enjoy having them with us. Um, I also need to introduce the other stars of our show. For those of you who are going to taste along with the presentation, um, this is our, our other panel, our, our um, flight of beers. Um, what in, in Eugene here, the panel and I are tasting a, a lager beer. Um, uh, we're tasting an amber, could also be a pale ale. Uh, a stout, a dark beer, could also be a porter if you don't have these at home. Um, an IPA, and then a hazy IPA. So this is the panel that this, or this is the flight that our panel will be tasting. And again, maybe if you're not in Eugene or Portland, you, you may have some other beers here. 
this would be a great time to use the chat box to tell us what great breweries beer you're, you're tasting. To help us with this, and I'm sure you're all thirsty right now and wanting to get started with the tasting part if you're doing that. Um, so uh, Dana is going to uh, give us a little bit of a tutorial here on how best to uh, taste your beer. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dana. Hey all, hi, I'm Dana Garvis. Um, I run Oregon Brew Lab, and as Jim told you, I also judge beer professionally um, and help hand out awards to deserving breweries. Uh, one of the first things you're going to do when you're looking at a beer, hopefully you have yours, and I can see people are starting to put their beer in the chat. Um, the first thing you're going to do is you're just going to observe it. You're going to look at it. You know, if a bartender just brought it to you and you're expecting a stout and it looks like this, you're probably going to send it back. So the first thing you're going to do is observe your beer. You can look at the color, the clarity. Can you see through it? Um, can't see through this hazy. Uh, look at the head retention. How long does does the lacing last around the top of the top of the head? And then carbonation. Do you have bubbles coming up from the bottom, or is it as flat as water? So we're building our expectations uh, just by observing the beer. So to actually interact with the beer, we're going to do a waft. So we're just going to slowly pull the strongest aromas towards our nose. That's a little bit of a, a miming situation here, um, but we're just going to do a quick waft. And what's that that's going to do is that's going to pull really, really heavy, um, really volatile flavors towards your nose right away. So you'll be able to say, oh, that's malty or that's hoppy. Um, maybe there's an off flavor. Um, then we're going to go into our third step, which is a deep smell. We're really going to get in there. Oh, maybe you even accidentally get a little uh, beer in your nose. That's okay. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to expand on those terminologies. So maybe before you said hoppy, but now we can say, okay, it's hoppy. Let's break it down. It's like a floral hoppy or it's a, a fruity hoppy. If you said malty before, maybe we can break it down and say it's bready or crusty or it's nutty. So we're going to go a little further down. And then step four, we finally get to taste the beer, but what we're gonna do is we're just gonna do a little sip. We're just gonna pull a little bit into our mouth and kind of let it rest on our tongue. We're gonna observe sort of how it, how it feels, that actual physical texture. Mm. I have a lager, so mine's like very carbonated. It's got a nice little dance of bubbles on there. Um, and then you're gonna do a big full drink like you would at the bar. And what we're looking for is really dive deep into those those uh, characteristics and those flavors. So looking for that, that strong maltiness that we discussed earlier and breaking it down further. And then finally, the third step, and one of my favorite is called retronasal. And uh, it's one of the main reasons why um, beer judges don't spit, uh, but wine, wine judges do, is because we need to have um, all those retro flavors come back out. So we're gonna exhale after swallowing. Um, and what that does is kind of pull forward some of those much more um, uh, hidden or, or harder to find flavors in the back end. Cheers. Okay. So Dana, thank you so much. And I hope everybody at home is having an opportunity to, to sort of dig into their beers and start examining them. Um, what we're gonna do next is um, we're gonna you know, dive into the chemistry of beer. And I've got, if you had the opportunity to take our poll at the beginning, you'll start to see some of the questions that really inspired me to think about this topic. Of course, as a chemist, I'm always interested in chemistry and I do love beer, but What's the, you know, what is the chemistry behind this uh, delicious beverage? So let's, let's go through the, the um, poll questions. First one was whether, you know, true or false, whether the straw was invented 5,000 years ago for the purpose of drinking beer. And the answer is true. Um, this uh, this uh, artwork um, that's been dated to 2600 BC shows um, uh, Sumerians uh, drinking out of large straws that were used to filter away the beer that was brewed within these big casks from the sediment in the bottom. So um, the reason that I put this in here is I just think it's so incredibly cool, the, the long history of beer and the way in which humanity figured out 
how to, um, to produce this beverage before we knew any science whatsoever. Um, the, next, the next question was, uh, what, you know, that I put in here because Oregon has such a rich brewery history or brewing history of its own. Um, the, the history of Oregon's beer um, dates back to the mid 1800s. And the first brewery was actually Liberty Brewery. Turns out there never was any such thing as a white stag brewing company. Um, City Brewery came after Liberty. And then of course the famous Henry Weinhardt Brewing Company uh, came a little later. Um, these companies had to make it through prohibition. And you can see here that actually, since we grew so many hops in Oregon, we actually had to do something with them. And we ended up making cereal based beverages without any alcohol, but used up a lot of hops. So these are the kinds of things that are part of our rich history in Oregon from the brewing industry. Of course, there's been a national scene as well. And you know, the question, next question is which president signed the bill legalizing home brewing in the US? Um, I think a lot of people knew that it was Jimmy Carter. The other presidents here had other famous incidents with beer and alcohol. Um, Woodrow Wilson was president when prohibition began, FDR when it, when it was repealed, and uh, Barack Obama brewed the first, white, or the first beer in the White House itself in 2011. Uh, true or false, the law to legalize the establishment of brew pubs in Oregon also made it legal to sell Coors beer across the state. Again, um, Oregon was, has been a pioneer in this area, and I always find that fascinating. The answer to this one is true, and the reason that this is interesting is that in um, uh, 1985, a, a law was passed that actually allowed, um, home, actually allowed brew pubs also allowed selling of wine in B and B's, and allowed the selling of unpasteurized beers like Coors. So prior to that, it was illegal to sell Coors because it was unpasteurized, and it was also illegal in other states like Georgia, which inspired the 1977 movie Smokey and the Bandit, where they bootlegged a truckload of Coors beer from Texas, where it was legal to sell it back to Georgia. Um, Oregon is the epicenter of many of the raw ingredients of brewing as well. So what percentage of the worldwide hop production occurs in the Pacific Northwest? I looked at the poll and a lot of you got this answer correct, 40%. So um, you know, this used to be mostly Oregon, but the Yakima Valley in Washington is now a real hotbed for hop production. What about the ingredients? Um, so the Reinheitsgebot uh, in Bavaria in 1516 actually allowed only three ingredients, water, barley, and hops. Um, we now know, of course, that you can't make beer without yeast. Um, and, uh, but the thing is that in 1516, uh, yeast wasn't known at that time, so it wasn't included. And then how many chemicals are present in a typical beer? So part of the genesis of this talk is that it turns out, you know, if we only have maybe four types of ingredients that are listed on a beer, how many chemicals make up the, all the delicious flavors, aromas, and colors that we see? Turns out the answer is more than 750. And we don't really even know, but the estimates are that it's definitely more than that. So what do all those chemicals do? And by the way, congratulations if you got them all right. I don't think I've ever had anybody get all the answers right if they haven't seen them before. But if you did, pat yourself on the back. You can chat and say how great you are. Um, the, so anyway, all those chemicals, they are responsible for an amazing uh, set of uh, sens you know, sensory experiences. They are responsible for all of the aroma that you um, can sense when you, when you uh, evaluate a beer. So all these volatile chemicals are really important for the aroma. They also make the head of the beer. So CO2 makes the bubbles in beers, or if you have a nitro, it's a mixture of CO2 and nitrogen. And that head will stay, it will be retained, partly because there are proteins there that help stabilize the foam and make it uh, you know, robust. In the body of the beer itself, we have esters like, that are fruity flavors. Of course, we have ethanol. There's a lot of water there, so it's a good hydration um, uh, beverage. Uh, we have uh, 
hop acids that provide bitterness, and then we have long sugars or starch molecules that can provide mouth flavor or other um, types of sweetness in the beer, even after it's fermented. But again, where do all of these chemicals come from? Um, there was a big push to, for companies to say everything that's in their beer, and it's not terribly surprising what Budweiser said when they were pushed. They said it's water, barley, malt, rice, yeast, and hops. Okay, and if you look at all of the other companies that reported in, here's an IPA. It's water, barley, malt, hops, and yeast. And Heineken is water, barley, malt, hops, and yeast. You know, clearly an IPA and Heineken are different. So it's got to be much more than those ingredients. It's the chemicals. But where do they come from? Well, they come from yeast and enzymes that are, I think of as nature's chemical factories. And again, thinking back in the history, brewers have been making beer for over 5,000 years. And we've only known that yeast existed for about 160 years. And we've only known about enzymes for maybe 100 years. So I, I find it amazing that we were able to get to a point where we could make really amazing uh, beers without even knowing what the mechanisms were by which those chemicals that make the flavors and aromas possible. Um, I think it's a real testament to our human ingenuity that we're able to figure that out and, and learn how to control those processes. So I often like to say that it's, it's, you know, it's trial and error and, and intuition that makes the discovery possible. It's more reproducible so we can get the same beer each time. And I just wanted to point out what these kinds of enzymes that we're gonna lean on for beer look like. All of these blue lines are the chemical structure, the outline of the bonds and atoms that make up an enzyme. So it's rather large compared to the, what we call the substrate that would sit in a very defined pocket in that enzyme. And then the enzyme allows a specific reaction to take place. We'll talk some more about some of those going forward. We talked earlier about umpa bands, if you were on uh, as we were getting warmed up here. This is the kind of the way I think about, you know, as an analogy for how we, we control the chemistry of the beer. These critical ingredients are like, I think, the notes in music. The umpa band has instruments, which are like the chemical factories that take those notes and make sounds. Um, and the sounds that we get are the flavors, aromas, and colors that make these beers unique. And the brewer is the one who directs it all to harness those basic ingredients and ends up converting them into the amazing um, beers that we are able to taste. So let's look back at our flight again now with that perspective. You know, each of these beers that we're looking at have different colors, they have different flavors, aromas, and all of that is a consequence of the chemistry that's there. Some of these we can even start to quantify, like how much alcohol is present in the terms of the percentage, or the international bittering units that help us define about how bitter beer might be. You can see, for example, that the, um, the stout is quite a bit less bittered than, let's say, the IPA. And then there are metrics of color, in this case, SRMs, a small number like three for the lager is light, whereas 35 for the stout is, is quite high. So out of these four basic ingredients that we use, how does this all happen? Well, it's a pretty complex process actually, wherein every step along the way, we're harnessing chemistry to convert these raw materials into um, the beers that we love. So we're gonna take a little bit of a tour through these and then stop along the way and do some interactive tasting with our panel and you at home can taste along as well. One of the things that if you go to a brewery and you look around, you see stacks of grain. These are the main raw ingredient that goes into a beer. Um, but something happens to that grain before it even gets to the brewery. So let's first talk about this process of malting that helps us take barley that comes from the field and get it ready to do brewing. 
Um, so malting is a process by where, wherein we steep the barley in water and let it start germinating. Here's, a, you know, here's what barley looks like in the field, so to speak. Um, so we have these long um, stalks with the barley grains at the ends. Um, those get, those inside those, if you were to just pick them up and chew on them, you, it'd taste really starchy. It'd be like eating pasta or flour. It, it really is like eating flour. Um, you have these long chains. Those long chains are all made up of sugars, such as I've circled here. So a sugar is what we need for fermentation, but these starches like amyl pectin and amylose that live, that, that are found inside the barley, they're, they're not um, at all available. They don't taste sweet, they taste starchy. So they've got to be broken down into, if we're going to ferment this uh, material, we, they need to be broken down into sugars that can be fermented, like glucose and maltose. So this is a challenge. We have this starchy stuff. We need to make sugars out of it. The sugars need to, uh, that, that can be finely fermented. It turns out that malting is the way, the way that that happens. Nature provides us the solution to this. So when we malt the barley, as I mentioned just before, we first get it wet, um, we, we uh, add water to the barley and it starts to germinate. Here's a picture of a grain and then as it starts to germinate, you can see that it's actually starting to grow. And we let that happen for a few days and then dry it. So here's an example where you can see drying of that malted barley. What's Really, the magic of all of this is that during the process, as these seeds start to get ready to grow, the cell walls get broken down. Um, that makes the starch more accessible. But even more interesting to me is that the grains actually produce the enzymes inside the grains that, that are the very enzymes that will end up converting the starch to sugars. So really it makes its own enzymes that are needed for that process. So we dry the grains because we need to do that to store them, otherwise they would rot or continue to grow. Um, but also we start to roast them. So if all we did was dry them, we would end up with one type of, of barley um, that looks an awful lot like this Pilsner barley on the, on the left side, right? So that, that's what would happen if we only dried it. If we start to roast it a little bit, particularly in this case, this Karamunic uh, malt, if we roast it wet, it starts to actually create sugar and then it crystallizes on the outside. And then if we keep heating it more, we get this really dark carafa. So I'm gonna turn it over to the panel who actually have these grains sitting in front of them. They're gonna chew on those a little bit and tell you what they're tasting um, for each of these grains that all started in the same place. They all started here, but took different paths to these other examples. Mark, I think you're first, aren't you? Yep, just finishing chewing. Um, I, I, so I'm, uh, I've got the Pilsner and it is, uh, it's, a, it's light, uh, it's light in color, but it's also very light. Um, flavor. It's uh, lightly sweet, a little flowery. There's a little bit of malt flavor there. Um, not, not a lot though. It just it's, it's mild. It's nice. Um, compared to the others that are going to come, it's, it's kind of gentle. Betsy, you're next. I have the Karamunic. And, um, this one is definitely compared to the Pilsner especially more bready. Um, I just, growing up, my parents ate this really dry brand cereal and it kind of reminds me of how that tasted. <laughs> um, so it brings back that memory, but maybe a little bit of biscuit uh, flavor in there and some toffee as well. So a little bit, a hint of sweetness, toffee caramely in there. Yeah, um, I think the, the Karamunic to me reminds me of like grape nuts, if you've ever had grape nuts for, for breakfast. That might have um, been what they were eating. <laughs> <laughs> I like, I could probably eat malt all day, really. Um, I have the, um, 
uh, Carafa Special, um, which right off is just like burnt. Um, but then there's some smokiness. Um, and you get sort of like a dryness, like an instringency that's like really drying out my mouth and like sucking in all the moisture. Then there's like some smokiness. And at the end, there's just like a little, little hint of chocolate um, or, or some coffee. Cool. So, so we have these three malts. So the question is, you know, how do we get, get there? There's such different flavors. And, you know, this is actually one of the kind of uh, dials that brewers can turn to really manipulate their beers. So we're going to... Um, well, I did want to... Look, can I oh, throw out one more thing? Yeah, sure. One of the go things that I, um, I really like to do and that I know um, we've done before is eating one of these malts that's actively in the beer um, and, then, and then sipping on the beer really brings out that really, really flavor, flavorful um, malt profile. So if we take something like the Citrophonics um, and eat some of this, uh, I mean, either the Cara or the Pills malt, um, it's going to really bring out that malt flavor and override any hop flavor. Before we continue with the presentation, we're getting a couple questions uh, just in case uh, people asking if there's going to be a recording available of this presentation after. Uh, we are recording this and we are planning to send that out in a thank you email as well as post it on the UO Alumni Association YouTube page. Um, so everybody will be able to access this event uh, afterwards. Great. Thanks, Eric. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's tasty interesting when you, you start working on those grains that, that have complementary um, or additional flavor. That's really nice. Yeah, it's super cool. So as, as, um, as Dana said when she was tasting the carafa, um, that really dark malt, um, there's a lot of intense flavor that comes with that. And uh, the, the flavors that we're interested in actually come from a quite famous uh, reaction that I know all of you have done, the Maillard reaction, um, which is what leads to um, you know, the, the flavors associated with coffee and browned uh, meat, of course, beer, bacon, poultry. So the the reaction is actually takes place when you have proteins which contribute an amino group and sugars and these sugars and the uh, the proteins start to condense with one another and the more you heat them the more they condense and these things that start off as chains um, start cyclizing and making these types of uh, ring structures that you can see have uh, descriptors uh, like cooked, roasted, toasted, um, nutty, um, meaty, burnt, sweet, caramel, all kinds of different flavors that result as we continue to um, heat the materials. And here's a blow up just to show some of that a little bit more. If we keep going and keep going, then we'll go well beyond the flavor, these kinds of flavors that might be really prominent in that middle um, that, that middle uh, grain that we tasted. And then they start being, they start converting into these things called the melanoidins that are um, similar in those very dark malts to the malt, the kind of colors and compounds in coffee. So I have this panel here that's not, not an expert in tasting, but they actually do have um, people who, for, for the, their living, will taste all of these malts and they come up with these wheels that help describe the flavor so that we can compare more readily. So looking at the first malt, that light colored malt that Mark tasted, you can see what the, the experts say is sweet and malty and sweet, but really not a lot of other flavor or aroma profile. If we compare that to the Kara Munich that Betsy was tasting, you can see all of a sudden there's a lot more kind of roasted flavor, caramel flavors, um, you know, biscuit and honey. There's just a whole lot more uh, variety of flavors that come together in that uh, Kara Munich malt. 
Um, and again, all of those are from the Maillard reaction where we're starting to take sugar and protein and, and bring those together to make new compounds. So more chemistry happening. And then finally, if we compare the Caramunic to the Carafa Special, the dark malt that Dana tasted, you can see that there's a really much stronger flavor in this quadrant of the wheel. And if we blow up this roasted um, area, you can see, you know, there's bready, coffee, dark chocolate, and, you know, we can take advantage of all those flavors when we make beer. So now it's time for the panel and for everybody else to, to hopefully compare some of these lighter and darker um, uh, beers and also, you know, not only the color of them, but also how the malt influences the flavor. All right, so um, well, I think we're gonna start with the lager beer, the lightest one. That's Betsy. That's me. Um, yeah, so the color of this one um, is definitely kind of like a pale gold. And um, if you take a sip of it, I would say it's not, um, it's very crisp. Um, you get a sense of kind of a light biscuit in there, um, but it's not overwhelming malt flavor, but it's definitely um, prevalent in that beer. Um, I've got the amber. If you're drinking an amber, let us know what the amber is in the comments here. Um, for me, I get some toastiness, like fresh toast. Definitely some breadiness, some strong, sweet caramel maltiness. Um, I also get a little bit of stone fruit in here, some like raisin notes almost. Um, and you know, there is a little bit of bitterness, I think, maybe from some of the darker malt. Um, but for the most part, it's sweet and smooth. Mark, you love the stout. I've got the stout. It's the stout. Uh, very, very dark. Um, you cannot, I'm looking out my window, holding it up to the sky, and it's blotting it out. So um, <laughs> a good northwesty dark stout. Um, as you taste it, This one, I, I come back to a, a strange feeling of like breakfast in a way, you know, that like your toast has gone a little long. You've made really, really strong coffee. You get, <laughs> there's a lot of that. There's a lot of toasted. Um, there's a lot of, with some chocolate back in there, there's, there is some, like, I, I feel it's an espresso stout. So it's a very strong kind of coffee kind of flavor, which is really nice. Um, it's unexpectedly not, not so sweet. You know, I mean, there's a bitterness to it. Um, Jim, I had a question. You picked the Carafa um, malt. Is that in the espresso stout, this espresso stout, or is it another really dark toasted malt? No, it'll be way more dark than that. It's probably, I don't know exactly which one they use, but it's probably a black malt or, um, or could, be the, could be a Carafa, the dark Carafa. Um, probably a chocolate yeah. malt, actually. Yeah. Yeah, the over the top is to take a bite of the dark of the dark malt though, and yeah, take a drink of this, and it's, hi, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It actually, if you if you eat that dark malt and then take a sip of this espresso stout, it actually somehow mutes the espresso because mm -hmm. that roasty maltiness is so strong. Yeah, yeah. I, I saw somebody was uh, drinking their um, chocolate stout and wanting to wanting ice cream to go with it. Um, so I, I, I agree with that as well. You know, a, a, a stout or a porter float is phenomenal. Um, and that's actually, you know, one of the reasons why they, they, start, they have started putting lactose in a number of these dark beers to give that, that sense of, uh, you know, the, the nice dark, um, you know, beer, but with that kind of milky flavor to go along with it. Yeah, and lactose adds like a really smooth, creamy mouthfeel that kind of adds like a, 
a little bit of a coating in your mouth. And so it just gives the impression of drinking some milk product, right? Yeah. Um, and, and in a beer like this, it doesn't have it, but if it did, it would, it would uh, round out some of those harsh astringent flavors and mouthfeels yep. uh, from that better chocolate. Cool. All right. Thank you, panel. I think we're going to move on to the next step along the way. So now we've got, we've got grains that we can use. So that's exciting. And we've got a great palette. You know, if you go to the homebrew shop, you can probably find 50 or more different grains that you can use as raw ingredients for beer. And we use all mixtures of those to create the kinds of flavors that the panel was just discussing and also the, the color. But the next step along the way is that we actually have to still convert that starch into sugar. That's called mashing. Um, so the mashing process, we take the grain, we put a bunch of hot water in there, and those enzymes that were made during the, the malting uh, stage go to work and they start chopping up all of the starch into fermentable sugars. All right, so these are our heroes. If you're a beer lover, you owe a lot to these enzymes. Um, and we'll talk about what each of them does a little bit more, but this is beta amylase, really important. Like without this, you can't end up taking starch and making alcohol out of it. Alpha amylase, again, you can see in these, the, these squiggles are the chemical structure of the enzyme itself. And these balls and spear, these spears here are actually the, a representation of the substrate. So each one of these has a specific binding pocket that grabs a hold of a substrate and then does a very specific chemical reaction. So each of these three enzymes, beta and alpha amylase and limit dextrinase, they each special that recognize a particular part of that starch and then attack it and cut it up. So to make it a little less chemically, um, here you can see what each of these enzymes does. The beta amylase chops off these two sugar linkages at the end. Alpha amylase just attacks chains and chops them up. And the, the limit dextrinase attacks, you know, attacks these uh, branches in the starch. They act as a team and at 145 degrees, all of them are working together. And if we just let them go at 145 degrees, we chop up almost all the starch into sugars, leaving almost nothing behind. And then all of that will end up getting fermented. That leads to a beer with a very little mouthfeel, really clean tasting beer. Oops, sorry about that. Um, but at, if we go to a just a little bit higher temperature, so just about 13 degrees higher, beta amylase stops working. And now we really just have alpha amylase and limit dextrinase. So what we end up with is chopping up the starches, but not making nearly as much of these fermentable sugars. And then at the end, after fermentation, there's sugars left over that contribute to the sweetness and the mouthfeel of the beer. So it's time to look at our flight again. Um, this time we're going to compare a lager to an IPA. So um, our panel's going to do that, and if you're, if you're following along at home, you can do that as well. If you're following at home and you, and you taste these, you know, go ahead and put in the chat the kinds of differences that you experience between the lager and the IPA. All right, who's got the lager? Got a lager? <laughs> I got a lager. I got a lager. I think, Dana, I think you're going to lead this. Oh, that was me. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so let's see. The lager is just really clean. Um, it's it's got a little bit of um, a mouthfeel that like sort of brings saliva to your mouth, um, so it's watering. Um, and it kind of, it's just really clean. Uh, it sort of is there, you're drinking it, and when you swallow, the flavors are gone. It doesn't really leave any sort of lingering uh, flavors around in your mouth. Um, uh, 
uh, but it does have a little bit of, um, I would say like a little bit of fruit peel expression. So like a, a lemon peel maybe, probably from uh, fermentation time. Yeah, that's, um, I had written down last time I drank this one, I wrote down snappy. It's very clean and crisp nice. and kind of, um, like you said, it snap, like it doesn't linger too long with you. Um, whereas, um, the sort of IPA has a very different, uh, sensation to it. Yeah, I would say the Citrophonics IPA is is heavier. I mean, it physically is heavier in the mouth. Um, it just weighs more. You, you asked us also, to do retrograde. Oh, sorry. <laughs> go for it, Mark. Oh, so you you were, you had mentioned doing retronasal. Got to use that word while I'm just talking about it. Um, <laughs> You know, you really have to try with the lager, you know, like, like what, you know, there's not a lot, there's just really not a lot there, but I feel like you drink the IPA and it's like, like a bouquet. I mean, it's just like, it fills your mouth. Totally. Yeah. And that's the other thing I would say the lager sort of stays on the tongue and then you swallow it and it's gone. This IPA is really, it's like a full mouth experience because it's not just sort of on the tongue and, and gone. It's, in the full mouth and it and it continues to linger. Nice. Yeah, really, really different, right? And so in the lager beer, um, essentially all those sugars were, con or all the starch was converted to sugar, all the sugar got fermented, and that really just leaves a very crisp, clean palate behind. Whereas deliberately, the IPA was fermented at a higher temperature so that there would be a nice um, sweetness and mouthfeel associated with that. So again, we're using that chemistry just that can be just a few degrees. Um, I made a, a Kolsch, which is a very light flavored beer, only five degrees difference. And one could really tell the difference in how one was very clean and the other one was a lot sweeter and, and more mouthfeel. Okay, so now we've got, at the end of a mash, what do we have? We have actually a lot of sugar water, essentially. It's colored sugar water, it's flavored sugar water, but it's really just a lot of sugar water. And what we need to do next is boil it and add hops. And that, so that's the next stage is the boil. Um, we refer to this sweet liquid as wort. Um, it's spelled wort, but it's pronounced wort or vert. Um, and so what we're gonna do is boil that and boiling does some really important things. So first of all, it sterilizes the beer. Um, in throughout human history, that's a, one of the reasons why beer has been so prominent is because you end up boiling it, it's sterile and it stay, because of the alcohol content, it stays that way. So it's actually a, a good liquid for, um, for example, traveling across the ocean. You can drink beer and not worry about getting sick from bacterial growth in the water. But it, in addition to that, come some really important things happen. Proteins um, start to coagulate. There's a lot of protein in this grain that was produced. Those start to coagulate. And coagulating just means that you know, they're, they're all bu bunching together, making you know, a sediment that we can separate. If we don't get those proteins coagulated, then later on they actually precipitate and it makes hazy beers. We'll talk more about hazy later. That used to be a really bad thing. Now it's a cool thing, but um, by boiling, we can precipitate the proteins and clarify the beer. There's also, um, during um, beer production, there's also the formation of chemicals that we don't like, like dimethyl sulfide, um, this you know, sulfury kind of uh, compound is something we want uh, to get rid of. And it, it is volatile, so it's driven off during the boil. But perhaps the thing that many of you care the most about is that when we add hops, turns out that the, the things within hops that are important for bitterness are alpha acids, but alpha acids aren't soluble in, in uh, water 
by themselves. So we boil them to carry out another chemical reaction to make them soluble. I'll get to that in a minute, but here's a hop cone that you can see. These are the things that grow on the vines with a B actually, not vines, but vines when you're talking about hops. And these yellow things that you might be able to see here is the lupulin that contains the alpha and beta acids and essential oils that create bitterness in beer, but also give all of those amazing flavors and uh, aromas. So I said we needed to boil hops in order to make the alpha acid soluble. What does that do? So this is the sh chemical structure of an alpha acid. And when we boil it, as I said, it's insoluble. So it just sits there in the beer, um, but doesn't dissolve. Um, but when we boil it, it changes its structure. And this structure is actually soluble. So the boiling is very important for getting bitterness into beer. We can get other flavors, essential oils to go into water, um, but in order for bitterness to occur, we have to boil. So let's talk a little bit about hops. Um, the panel has several hops that we're gonna talk about a little bit. I, before we do that, um, again, these are what we would refer to as the cones of the hops. You can see some of them here. You know, this is what is picked from the hop vines and then dried out so that they don't mold um, and are stored. So th that's one form of hops. Alternatively, we sometimes grind them up and pelletize them. So the Fuggles hops here and the Apollo hops are actually pelletized versions, which are easier for breweries to handle. Um, and they, they also tend to store a little longer because they, don't, they aren't as exposed to oxygen. So anyway, we have the Fuggles, Cascade, and Apollo. And each of our panelists is going to tell us a little bit about what they smell and maybe they taste um, in each of these hops. You're not going to trick me into tasting these, Jim. <laughs> yeah, definitely <laughs> be careful with the Apollo. You might ruin your taste buds for a decade. <laughs> At least. Well, I've got the Fuggles. I'm, I, I guess I, I'm leading. Wait, I've got to get in the camera yeah. here. Um, pelletized. You know, it's, uh, it's grassy and minty, you know, and I, when I think about this, it's like mowed grass, but not like immediately mowed grass, like kind of the sun's been on it for a while and it's kind of dried out, maybe like an alfalfa bale, kind of there's something like that. It's, it's really pleasant to, to smell it. I mean, I love smelling hops anyway. Um, this one is, this one's gentler though. I mean, it's, uh, as we get into the other two, particularly the Cascade, I won't go there, but um, it's like really pungent had to leave it closed. This one, you can kind of <laughs> let it waft a bit, you know, yeah. it, it also, I mean, it's in, in English ales, right? So this feels very like a mild English ale. Yeah, well, don't, don't you think it almost mirrors the sort of that British persona, you know, uh, mild mannered, polite. Yes, <laughs> probably dry sense of humor, maybe. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, definitely earthiness to that one. Um, a little bit of fruitiness in there too, I think. Yeah, I agree. Um, so I have the Cascade hops you, and you, these are, try not to make too much of a mess on my computer here, but you can, and so, um, ooh, uh, these are pretty bold. <laughs> very bold. There's a really strong aroma. Um, definitely very citrusy in there. A little bit of floral notes to those as well. I did make a mess. <laughs> yeah. that. I was trying to break it open and get like the full sense of it. But yeah, definitely. You're here on a brewery floor. <laughs> I'm actually in the garage, but yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, very very bold and um, maybe like grapefruity, citrusy uh, aroma to that. It totally smells like an IPA to me. Cascade is sort of was so influential in the explosion of the IPA. To me, it's just like oh yeah, IPA sure. Yeah. 
my office has smelled like cascade hops all day today as I was getting ready. So <laughs> That's I, I'm pretty excited about that. There are worse things that your office could smell like, I suppose. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, you have to keep it zipped closed, the packet, or else it's going to blow up the fuggles. Totally. <laughs> and don't, don't leave it in the fridge unzipped because yeah. everything in the fridge will then taste and smell like hops. Uh, I have the Apollos, and um, right when I first get in there, I mean, it is just piney. It is so, it is like a forest floor. It has like a resinous, um, you know, we're in Oregon, so it has a, a dank sort of marijuana um, aroma to it um, and then there's like a really nice like citrusy uh, element to it that's almost um, I don't know it's not not quite I would say like a lime or a lemon kind of citrus um, it's it's definitely the least pungent of the three um, I would say the other two have like really really strong uh, long-lasting flavors where this um, Apollo is maybe a little more muted, it seems. Yeah. I think it's definitely pleasant. And I'm I'm smelling like thyme, like herbal. Yes. Thyme. Yeah, that's right. You brought yeah. that up last time too. <laughs> like a little bit of um kitchen kitchen herb cabinet. Yes, exactly. So it's basically well, I bit into it last time. Sorry. Oh, so it's basically a kitchen herb cabinet followed by herbal in the park kind of smell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Whitt Whitaker in August. Yes. <laughs> and I bit into it on a challenge last time and ah, it's very, very bitter. That was a week ago <laughs> if your taste buds ever recovered from that? Uh, slowly. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks, panel. So let's let's just take a look at these um, these different hops. And what I want to point out is because of the di different chemical compositions of these hops, things. So the three major roles that they play are providing bitterness. We talked about that. Also flavor, and then aroma. And so the fuggles um, that Mark was tasting is not terribly bitter. We judge bitterness by that alpha acid that's five percent and you know mint grass floral tones okay um the cascade that betsy was was uh evaluating it's about the same bitterness um but flowery spicy citrus quality some grapefruit in there very pleasant um whoops um and then the apollo that dana was looking at you know is a real look at the alpha acid here is really high. So this is a very bitter hop. Um, and then as she pointed out, this dank resinous aromas and flavors with some citrus to balance that. So um, each of these would have their own role and often we use hops in, in different combinations. Um, this is uh, for, for those of you who are not chemists, which is probably all of you or most of you, um, what we have here is a, a gas chromatograph, which allows us, uh, or chromatograph, that allows us, to, it's an instrument that allows us to analyze what volatile compounds would be in something. In this case, we have a pretty, you know, pretty, um, I guess, unremarkable hop. The Kent Golding's hop is a really pretty muted kind of hop. And what we have here are the major peaks that show up are labeled, and then there's all these other peaks. So what you see is that there are 24 different compounds in that aroma that are labeled. And then you can see there's probably at least another that many that aren't labeled, meaning that this, the aroma of this hop has probably at least 50 compounds that contribute to the palate or the, of, that, um, of that hop. You can see also that there are several really important um, components. The, there are bigger peaks like this one at four, this one at 12, this one at 14, big peaks. These are myrcene, carophyllin, and humulene, which are some of the most uh, prevalent uh, essential oils in all hops. So a lot of the hops have the same kind of, these same big components, but then the differences are uh, related to all of the minor components. And here you can see 
just a huge a range of different kinds of chemicals that are in those aromas. These are the essential oils. And again, um, oops, uh, so, you know, the, these, these being the big three here, and then all these other different players that will contribute in different ways to this mixture of what I say is a, a symphony for the nose and taste buds. And we categorize these kind of like we did with the, the grains in terms of flavor. So um, you can recognize some of these different types of aromas that people that our panel had talked about. So, you know, it's not surprising that, that um, a lot of the hops give the same kind of aroma as marijuana, given that they're in the same family. You know, cloves, grapefruit, floral, We've talked about a number of these things, and these are the descriptors that we can use to make sure that, you know, that we can compare talking to each other about you know, what these different aromas are. So that brings us then to the impact of the hops on our beers. And we're gonna compare, the panel's gonna compare three here, and you can see below each of these which hops have, have been used. In, in each of the beers that they're gonna be talking about. And I think in this case, um, we're gonna have, um, uh, I think we're gonna have Betsy uh, tell us a little bit about what she sees as the difference between the lager and the IPA. And then uh, Dana is gonna talk a little bit about the differences between the IPA and the hazy IPA. Yeah, um, definitely in, um, Kind of what we discussed earlier with the lager, um, you're definitely getting like a slight, slightly herbal, but um, also some, like Dana said, some lemon peel in there maybe. Um, a little tiny, tiny bitterness on the finish of that, but it doesn't linger for very long, uh, but overall very mild. Um, compared with so the citrophonics for me, the last time I drank it was kind of a different experience from this can that I'm having tonight. Um, Cause last time I had a lot more hints of grapefruit and in this one I'm definitely getting lime, strong lime characteristics. In both the aroma and the taste and the flavor of it. And then also there's I'm getting more tropical flavors and they're like a passion fruit or something similar in, in there tonight when I'm drinking this. So, um, yeah, definitely, um, getting a sense of the, those, uh, citra hops in there for sure. Yeah. So, um, difference between the IPA and the hazy. Let me just, let me just do another check real quick. Yeah. Um, for me, the bitterness is way more obvious in the citrophonics in the IPA. Um, if, if you've got this beer with you at home, I want you to do this with me. So I want you to pull just a little bit into your mouth and kind of just let it sit on your tongue for just a few seconds before swallowing. Okay, and then we're going to go ahead and do that with your hazy. And you see how the hazy kind of just stays all, all right there in the center of your, of your palate, whereas with the citrophonics, with the IPA that's not hazy, that bitterness is all encompassing. Like it kind of surrounds the whole tongue from the front to the back and the sides, whereas this hazy is just like really smooth. The bitterness isn't very harsh. Um, it's just very, um, it, it's sort of just present without being overbearing. Not that the citrophonics is overbearing, but that it's just much more of a harsh bitterness. Like the difference between Baker's chocolate and milk chocolate in terms of, nice. of that bitter, yeah. bitter difference. Cool. Yeah. So there's a lot of chemistry that goes into why that's the case. Some of it has to do with water chemistry. Um, you know, we can accentuate the bitterness of hops by putting in um, 
more sulfate, uh, we can accentuate the, the more the smoother um, uh, flavors with more chloride in the water. Um, and they, what's, what is causing this beer to be hazy? In this case, it's there's protein there. There's, as we talked about before, extra protein that doesn't get coagulated. Turns out that protein can help mellow out some of the, the hop bitterness that we would normally have. So lots of really cool stuff. Again, yeah. you know, all of this is figured out by trial and error and experimentation, which makes it really cool. But of course, there's all science behind it too that, that makes it fun to try to understand. And I think there's a lot we still don't understand, but that makes it more fun. Yeah, and I'm realizing now I actually only described the mouthfeel and none of the flavors. Yeah. <laughs> well, and the flavors there actually are, we're going to come to fermentation in a little bit, you know, in the next stage. But it's not only the hops, but it's also the fermentation that's going to lead to those complexities of flavors. Yeah, totally. Hey, Jim, with all that going on, is it harder to maintain consistency from a brewing standpoint? you know, from batch to batch. I mean, something Betsy mentioned that this can seems to taste a little bit different. Yeah. So chemically, yeah, I, how does that? I don't, I don't know. I think it, in, you know, in my view, um, the, the difficulty of designing uh, is, is increased. Yeah, you know, like it's more difficult to design when you, um, when you don't quite understand and you've got all these different parameters. Um, I think the real challenge with reproducibility is two things. One is you're working with natural products, grains different, hops different. Some of these hops, one year they're, the hops are like just the most resinous, dank hops, and another year it's like onions, and mm -hmm. you have to deal with that. So, so I think that that's a part of it. And then the other thing that's very hard about reproducibility is scale. You know, it's like a, us home brewers. You know, when we're brewing five gallons, it's not hard to. To, you know, to manipulate the temperature and things like that. But when you're trying to manipulate the temperature of a thousand gallons, it's a different deal and temperature gradients become problematic. So there, there's many reasons it's hard to reproduce, but those are some of them. So Mark, um, it's so difficult to reproduce beer from batch to batch that I actually made a job out of it. Yes. Um, <laughs> right, so I do quality control for breweries. Uh, and and help them hit targets for each batch. So generally, the larger the brewery, and this is a big um, generalization, but the larger the brewery, the more consistent their beer is going to be because they've been doing it for so long that they've you know really dialed in. So that Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, mwah, right? That's the same yeah. every time, no matter what city, what state, what country, uh, what temperature the can is at. Yeah, that beer is the same. Right. You go from a more local standpoint, they're going from um, local hops that they just got delivered from the hop yard down the street, uh, which is different than it was last year because they harvested a month difference. Um, you know, there's so many different reasons why beer, beer uh, consistency will be really different from batch to batch. Um, my guess is just that we have a week on these. Um, so we just added a week of age. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, we're gonna move on the last. Now, now what we have is we've boiled this wort, we put hops in it, um, we sterilized it. Now we've cooled it down and we filtered it off. It's time to do some fermentation. All right, so we're gonna add yeast to this. We're gonna add some oxygen because in the early stages of metabolism, the yeast need oxygen to get going. After, after a short while, then it becomes anaerobic because all that CO2 pushes the oxygen out and that prevents us from making vinegar instead of beer. Um, so I don't have a lot to say here. The, the, the yeast are amazing organisms that help us do this, right? They, they have in the yeast, they have all of these great enzymes that allow us to convert the sugar to alcohol. They generate CO2 as a byproduct. They make a lot of flavor chemicals, and those flavor chemicals are like esters, fruity flavors. Those depend upon what the temperature is that they, not only the yeast type, but the temperature of the fermentation. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, they really like glucose and maltose. Um, the fact that they can only really 
convert those to alcohol is, again, what leads to the mouthfeel. The other sugars are left behind. In fact, the cell walls of the yeast don't even allow those larger sugars or starches inside the yeast. Only maltose and glucose can come in, and when they do get in, the enzymes convert them to ethanol and CO2. So the fermentation process is really important. Again, many, many strains of yeast, lager yeast and ale yeast, many different kinds of yeast that all contribute in different ways to the chemistry and therefore the flavor of the beers that they help us make. So we're gonna do one last comparison here. In this comparison, we're gonna look at the lager beer versus the hazy IPA and think about what, what role does the yeast play in these? You know, and for this, I think Mark is gonna lead us off on the panel. Yeah, so we've we've talked a bunch about the the lager kind of almost as a reference point in some ways. And you drink the the hazy and you really get this grapefruit thing um going that's that's really big and uh which is wonderful. Um and it there's a and there's a different mouthfeel and things like that as well. I, I will go back though. I mean, I think that the lager depends on how you're how you're drinking it you know if uh i almost feel like the grapefruit if you're thirsty in some ways that that ipa might not actually be as quenching in some ways as the lager is you know the lager is so crisp and so clean you know it's it's easy to sort of run it over with a bunch of flavors but it's really really nice um that said you know the hazy is really fun to take sips of and really think about um because there is so much going on there. And that big fruit bomb that's in there is really interesting. Makes me think about the first time I tried to brew um, um, Hefeweizen and came out with bananas. And I was like, that's got to be wrong, you know? No, that's um, right. <laughs> but I learned that that was okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, these yeasts are like, these, these strains of yeast are so, um, it's it just so, there's so much diversity there that we can tap into, you know, so I, I have listed on the top of the slide, you know, how well do they attenuate? So, you know, attenuation tells us how much sugar do they leave behind at the end? So for example, in a lager beer like this, you know, that like the one we're tasting, you want that to attenuate. You want it to take all that sugar down. You really make it clean. The hazy IPA is likely, um, um, fermented at higher temperatures with a yeast that produces lots of those really cool ester flavors that you're, you're tasting. And then flocculation is how much the yeast will precipitate to the bottom after it's all done with its work. And uh, for example, in Mark, in your Hefeweizen, it stayed cloudy, I'm sure, right? Because Hefeweizen yeast doesn't flocculate very well at all. So when you're drinking that Hefeweizen, the yeast is still present in there. So and in any case, there's so many different ways in which we can manipulate the chemistry in, in these, using these different yeasts, as again, using this as a sort of a chemical factory. All right, so just to go back here, you know, we started with four basic ingredients. We went through all of this process and I, I, don't, I don't in any way want to belittle all of the really important stuff that happens after fermentation, but we're gonna stop here for today. And I just, you know, I just wanna, you know, you know re-emphasize that um, beer, beer is just an amazing complex liquid that has all these varied flavors, aromas, and colors, and they all come from the chemicals that are produced by the enzymes in yeast. You know, and, and we don't add any of those. Imagine if we had to put a label on the beer that had 750 ingredients. Um, and frankly, we don't know exactly what they are, how much there are and what order to put them in anyway. So we don't add those, but really we harness nature's chemical plants, the, the enzymes to make them. And that's, that's what brewers are excellent at is figuring out how to do that. Um, we're kind of learning how to harness the nature, nature's machinery and to understand the chemistry. And if we can do that, we probably are going to be able to create even better interest, you know, new combinations. We've been doing this for at least 5,000 years. There's papers that are highly disputed that suggest maybe it's been 12,000 years. Um, regardless, it's a long time. 
And there's a, still a lot we don't know about the roles of all those chemicals that are produced. Um, but I, I hope that the, the, our, our presentation and panel here has helped you appreciate what is just the most amazing intersection of human creativity, history, and science. And personally, I'm, I'm really looking forward to what's next. You know, what's the next thing beyond the hazy? What's the next really cool thing we're gonna come up with? So with that, uh, that's the end of the presentation. We'd love to answer questions and um, look forward to receiving those from you. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, it's a great opportunity for us to share our love of beer with you. Cheers. Jim, we had one question uh, that we didn't get to during the presentation. Uh, which was about the practice of harvesting and keeping hops. Uh, we have somebody who has some hops growing in their backyard and they want to try it out to, to homebrew. Yeah, um, so the first thing you want to do, at least right now, like if you were to step outside in this okay Eugene weather, um, you would want to cut out any, you want to cut off, snip the tops off of any brand new canes that grew um, within the last couple of months. Um, and then the canes that are left, I think this was Jessica who asked this question. Um, what you're gonna do is you're gonna string those up and you wanna give them a really strong support to get really tall. And I mean really tall, not just taller than you, like eight feet if you can. Um, and those are gonna take all summer to grow and they're gonna slowly grow um, and slowly you know, produce little hop cones that are gonna hang off and they're really pretty. Um, and once those are ready to go, probably about, oh, August or September, depending mm -hmm. on the ripe zone, uh, you're going to go out there and physically pick each one. Um, and ideally, you store them um, vacuum sealed if you have that option. If not, a Ziploc bag where you literally sit there and suck out the air um, because oxygen can degrade hops. Um, I actually have a blog on my website about how to make hop bitters. So if you love Manhattans and you want a little hop twist, um, hop bitters are, are dope. Yeah, one other thing, uh, I grew hops in my um, garden last year and they're already <laughs> growing like crazy this year. Um, you can make fresh hopped beers, so you can actually use them fresh which is really fun. I made a Saison with fresh hops in it. That was really fun. And then, yeah, we, we picked them and, and dried them um, and saved some of them for use later. I guess the one thing about that is it's kind of important to pick them at the right time when they're be, before they start to turn too brown or gray um, because those are starting to oxidize and that's, really? that's kind of a bummer. So when, you're, when your hop cones get really big and they're gonna continue to get really big and really plump, um, and there's a moment where you're like, oh, I should pick them. That first time, that first time you have that moment where you're like, I should probably pick these, that's where you're gonna pick one and you're gonna break it open. And there's some really awesome tutorials online that just show you Crosby Hops is a good one that's uh, Oregon based. They have nice little YouTube videos that'll show you how to break open the hop cone and look at the lupulin glands. Um, and, and so you're gonna wanna do that every day until it smells like exactly that heavenly yeah. perfect hop smell. So it's, it's, yeah. it's, um, it's kind I, of I like anything else in the garden. You, you kind of learn as you, yeah. as you grow it every year. Yeah, I think, I think sticky on the outside is also a pretty good, pretty good metric. The next question that we had uh, came in was, uh, if you could share tips about uh, how the brew container affects flavor. So cans versus bottles versus kegging. Yeah. So kegging is gonna be the closest you get to literally going to the brewery and just opening the tap right into your mouth because it's, it's had the least amount of physical interaction with uh, any machinery um, the least physical interaction with human. Um, and it's just going to be the best. It has the le least, uh, least likely to be uh, infected by oxygen. Um, cans, uh, well, let's, let's go to bottles. Bottles are really amazing um, because they will store your beer forever. And if they are brown glass, um, 
light won't be able to get in. There was a question here about green glass, um, and, and this is also true of blue glass, allows light to come in and skunk beer over time. Now, the, the, the well-known beers that you know in, in, in green bottles, uh, those breweries actually brew um, styles that allow for skunkiness flavors mm -hmm. um, to be in there in some, some form. So you won't notice it if it's a little higher because it's been in the sun longer. Um, and so I think if you have to do prepackaged product, glass is the best. Uh, but glass is really awful to take on a hike. Glass is really awful to take camping. Um, so cans are amazing, but um, cans, you know, I really pay attention to date codes when it comes to cans because um, in your lagers, in your pale ales, in your IPAs, if they've been in the can long enough, eventually they will turn an amber color and kind of have a little bit of an oxidation um, flavor. If you have a sour beer, so if we're sticking with this um, Oakshire flight and theme, uh, their cucumber Berliner Weiss, which is really money, um, I think it's sun-made. They have a blackberry version um, also. Uh, if that stays in a can too long, it's really acidic beer, and most acidic beers will start to tear the liner um, between the beer and the aluminum. So um, I'm pretty picky about what I drink out of cans, personally. Um, my favorite is to go get a corny keg fill at a local brewery. That's the, that is the freshest way to get beer. Yeah, uh, just one quick anecdote. Um, we traveled to Pilsen in Ch Czech Republic um, about a year ago and tasting the beer out of the wooden casks in the brewery versus on tap uh, 200 yards from the brewery to a can later, the, the flavors were very different, even though that is a highly you know, highly controlled brewing process of a major brewer, these things do matter. Yeah, that was a great question. What else you got, Eric? Uh, so other questions that have come by, um, we'll get to this one because this has actually been asked, uh, was asked earlier. Um, one of our participants wants to know about why he cannot stand IPAs but loves porters and stouts, other dark beers, and wants to know if it has to do with changing taste as, as he ages. Well, I think, you know, I think there's a lot, there are a lot of people out there that really just do not like the bitterness of, of an IPA. Um, I think this is actually a, a remarkable opportunity for the brewing community to understand that um, although that's really fat popular right now, look at the rise of the hazy IPA that is not nearly as bitter, but still has hot flavor. Um, look at you know, the resurgence of lagers, um, specialty lagers. I think the, the reality is that many people just don't like the harsh bitterness that's associated with the IPAs. Um, and I do think that, that there, there's um, at least from my own experience with people that, um, that have, where their taste has changed, as they've gotten older, they've been less tolerant of those super bitter beers. So um, I think, you know, that I, I see this as a huge opportunity for the brewing industry to continue to develop beers that um, cater to a palate that's not, you know, that's a little more bitter averse. All right, well, John, maybe the next time you could try a hazy IPA and, and that'll work a little bit better. Uh, the next you know, question that came in, sorry, go ahead, Dana. Oh yeah, it's not necessarily um, age, it's just time. Everyone's palate changes. When I first got into craft beer, I loved Ambers. That's all I drank. Drop Top was like one of my first, like, uh, I saw someone talking about Rennie's in here. That was my order at Rennie's, was a Drop Top. So, um, you know, and now I, you know, I think this Amber, this Oakshire Amber is the first Amber I've legitimately drank in years uh except for judging um so your your palate will change i i think don't pigeonhole yourself into one style because there's over 160 different beer styles recognized by the brewers association um and you're gonna have to go to a specialty bottle store to see all of them you can't exactly walk into a kroger and 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 get a mybach um as i saw someone else brought up in the chat 
So, you know, feel free to branch out. I, 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 the guy who likes the stouts and porters, go ahead and try a hazy IPA because it might blow your mind. One question that came across that I thought might be uh, interesting from a, a chemistry perspective was uh, we had uh, one of our participants ask how the process of brewing is altered for gluten-free beer. The, the process isn't really changed. Um, yeah. Actually, it's just the, the starting materials. Yeah, um, you've got to use... Sorghum's really popular. Uh, yeah. do you, did you go into gluten-free much, Jim? Not a, no, I mean, I mean, it's just, uh, you, well, there's a, for example, I think actually there's a few of the American lagers that are essentially gluten-free based upon their rice content, right? So it really is about what's your starting material, right? If you use a starting material that doesn't have gluten and you've got something that's fermentable, you can make a beer out of it. And that's been, you know, that's been part of the innovation for some of the breweries who've decided to go, you know, to, to explore gluten-free is how can you, you know, how can you um, find a, a stock of, mater of, of raw material that when you ferment it, and, you know, there's already people posting in the chat some of the different kinds of uh, approaches, but um, I think it's, yeah, like you said, Dana, it's all about, it's, it's really all about the, the starting materials. Yeah, I will say um, they probably use a very specialized yeast because a lot of yeast companies um, grow up their yeah, yeast yeah. pitches on yeah, yeah. Uh, barley yeah. uh, wort of some sort. And so um, I would say maybe their yeast pitch comes from a smaller, um, smaller supplier. I think we have time for probably about two more questions. Uh, first one is, uh, does peer, pouring a beer into a glass make a difference in the taste? And if so, why? I love that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's gonna, it's, it yeah. may, it may, because if you pour it in and you, and you um, do it in such a way that it immediately foams up and all of that CO2 leaves the beer, that actually changes the flavor. If you think about drinking a flat beer, something that's been sitting out for a while versus something that's you know, carbonated and straight out of the in depth, that, that acidity of the CO2 definitely changes it. it other things, Dana, that, that it would change? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I just, you know, let's go to the most extreme example. Would you drink wine out of a bottle? I mean, I, I don't want to judge, maybe you would. But. <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, um, um, it tastes different when you pour it. Uh, you know, um, as you can see, I don't, maybe not, I have different glasses, uh, for each different beer style. And that's because, um, for something like a Pilsner that doesn't have much of an aroma, I don't need to get my nose all up in there. I, I just need to pound it. Um, but for a beer like this hazy IPA that's full of amazing citrus and floral aromas, you know, I kind of want those to, to hang out in this headspace right here. Um, and so I'm going to actually consolidate those and get those really concentrated just like that. Um, and so, yeah, I think the glassware that you pour into is, is important. And then also um, whether or not you're drinking straight out of the can or out of the bottle, um, you know, for me, I personally try to keep the number of containers that the beer touches to a minimum. Um, I'm sure Betsy could, could really go into about how glassware can affect a beer. Um, it's one of the things, if you've ever gone into a brewery that uses really strong detergent in their glass washer. Definitely. That's why, um, if, if you go to a brewery and they're not rinsing out your glass first, it's not like wine where you don't, you need a dry glass. It's, um, you should, you should see them rinsing your glass <laughs> first because otherwise you're going to get that sense of um, detergent from washing the glasses in there. And so um, I agree with Dana. I think that um, the least number of containers you can have touch your beer, the better. 
And um, I know we have a kegerator here and there's, there's even a strong difference between um, the brewer's cuts that my husband gets from Cold Fire as a brewer there um, to we got a straight up fill of Cumulus IPA, which is one of their hazies there. Um, and the difference between that is just, it, it's night and day, the taste of it, that yeah. what, how much sediment is in it and how much time it's um, spent exposed to air and all of that is going to change the flavor of it. Okay, and the last question is, uh, is kind of a fun one. Um, in the beer community, is a hazy IPA perceived like flavored tobacco? Is it a fad that will pass? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, do I have any clients on the call? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's true. Uh, yeah, so let, 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 uh, hey, Dana, I can save you. I'll say it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> the, you know, um, the, there's there's this kind of uh, Venn diagram of, I think, of, you know, the people who, brewers who say they hate IPA or hate hazy IPAs, but still brew them. And, um, you know, why are they doing that? Well, they're brewing that because their customers want it. Moolah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you know, th there will be, um, I think, I think there will be other things that displace that, but a hazy IPA is, it's got two things going for it, right? It's got people love that mellow flavor. They really do. You know, it's fruity and it's sweet, but not too sweet. It's got all these great flavors to it. It's not bitter. And it's actually not that hard to brew in terms of um, time and tank space to do that. Some of the other things that are mass appeal, like lagers, really are expensive to brew because they take longer to ferment, they take longer to store. And gosh, if you can ferment at higher temperature, so it goes faster, makes all these great flavors, there's, I think there's a lot there, both economically you know it's 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 great from from the perspective of being cheap to brew but it also is something that people seem to really enjoy can i also add jim i um i think that hazy ipas are not going to go away because they are a great gateway beer for people <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah so i grew up in wisconsin on Spotted Cow, New Glarus. You might have heard the little accent in there. But, yeah, yes, um, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> the wheat. But there's always the, the different beers that um, get you into, into tasting new beers. And so once you get into that and you start expanding your palate and your palate changes, um, you get a lot more experimental in what you're tasting and what you will pick out when you go into that tap house and I so I think the hazy is great because I get why people are kind of oh all these hazies out there but I think the fruity notes in there and the way that it sits on your palate for a long time it really um, allows people who might not like like a traditional IPA to find their way into yeah. beer and then stick around for a while, which we want you to do. <laughs> so my, I, I will just say, I've definitely noticed brewers do not prefer to brew hazy IPAs and milkshake and smoothie IPAs. Uh, it, but um, what they prefer to brew varies from person to person. You know, I, I like Jim's analogy to making beer as making music because I think it's it's uh, analogous. Like, yes, most people are listening to pop. Most people are drinking hazy IPAs. But did you know this one band, this one brewery making lambics? Where was that question? Um, Ale Apothecary, Degard, and Little Beast. Yahats, check them out for uh, sour beers brewed in Oregon. Um, there's there's a lot. Are, are we at our end? Is that what that? Oh no, that was just uh, just my chat. E emails coming in or chat coming ah, in. Okay. 
Well, it's, I mean, think about what, that Carter was the one who legalized it in 78. So we've really only had like 42, you know, just 40 years of a, a generation or two of a couple of generations of new brewers. I mean, it's like, it's got to diversify. Um, you know, I, I remember moving to Oregon 20 years ago and thinking, oh my God, look at the list of beers that you can get here. This is amazing. And then how much that's proliferated. But I don't feel like many of them have dropped off the list necessarily. No, you just have to find the brewery that speaks to you. And, and there will be one because there's 8,000 of them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, well uh, I think we've come to the end of our session tonight. I just want to give a final thanks um, first to the, to the panel. Um, Dana, Betsy, Mark, thank you for helping us have the tactile experience of smelling and tasting the hops and barley and, and sharing your insight with us. Um, a big final thanks to Professor Jim Hutchison for sharing his ex expertise with us. I think we all had some much needed fun. Uh, and if you enjoyed learning and connecting with your fellow ducks through this program, I hope you can enjoy uh, some of our other events that are coming up. Again, that website to check those out is uoalumni.com backslash ducknest. Uh, and if everybody wants to turn on their video camera right now, we'll do a little virtual toast and then we'll sign off. Awesome. Oh my God, look at all you beer drinkers. Oh, we're so right. diverse. On the count of three, let's do uh, Toast with uh, with your O's if you have them. One, oh. two, <laughs> three. <laughs> Go Ducks! Go Ducks! Woohoo! Woo! Thanks Go everyone ducks. for joining. Thank you. you guys are awesome. Thank you all. Kind of cute. I root for Utah. Thank, Thank you. you. I know. Lots of fun. Thank you. Go Ducks! Salty. That was quite Thank informative. You. Thank you so much. Can't wait till you can come back to Bend Hutch. I, I'm ready anytime. Let's do this again. Yeah, same time next week, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> what about and, right and now? And we'll drop off the beer, right? <laughs> you guys were awesome. Great panel. Love it. Yes. Um, I don't know who's Thanks hosting, but I can stick around and answer some questions if anyone else wants to. I don't, I'm, you know, I'm not uh, UO affiliated, so I don't know who's on the pay, on the clock right now. I'm not ending it, so if people want to stay. And then Dana, it was nice you put up your email, so hopefully people, I think you'll, yeah. you might get some questions. Should I put it in there again? Maybe put it, type it in there again, yeah. yeah. Oh my God, somebody's having bangers and mash for dinner. Can I come over? <laughs> Oh, that's <laughs> oh, I like the fact that somebody has a Rainier here. I, I almost put my Rainier, um, my Rainier beer neon sign behind me here, but I thought it might be distracting. <laughs> Rainier beer. 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 We, nice. In the industry, what we are you guys like drinking down in um? In, in Oregon these days. So I'm up in Seattle right now, and so Rainier's everywhere. And I can't remember what cheap beer I was drinking it's, when I was at, in Eugene. It's all PBR here, if PBR. you can go cheap. <laughs> okay. I think we, the, Oli. we, Dana, don't we sell more per capita than anywhere else on PBR? In Oregon, yeah. Yeah. I mean, whenever we went to the bar, it was like, it was like pitchers and pitchers and pitchers of Mirror Pond, but. Uh, oh, pond water. Oh, no, it was, <laughs> haven't used that one yet. I think I think that's what the I think that's what the Deschutes brewers call it is pond water. In the industry, we like to joke that uh, in Rainier beer there is a single Yakima Valley hop, and if you find <laughs> it, you get a prize. That is awesome. <laughs> we call Ranye just to mess with the kids because they'll go for the Ranye. Ranye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Were there any questions we didn't get to or that somehow got skipped over? Um, I was looking online and noticed that this talk has happened a few times before, like maybe like a January, yeah. and like November 2018 or something. Yeah. 
have you guys gone with other breweries or have you been just uh, kind of focusing Oakshire or? Okay, so, so that's a great question. I, although, looks like you have the Oakshire beers there. Nice job. We, um, yeah, we, they, yeah, they had, they made this like six pack. Special. I know, isn't that yeah. awesome of them? So um, I did this, so I actually went on sabbatical um, a couple years ago and part of my sabbatical plan was to think about how we could do brew, you know, these kind of talks where we, we bring the chemistry of, of beer to the public. So I did a, at the end of that, I did a quack chat thing at the Axe Billy here in Eugene, which was okay because, you know, they had some beers. They actually blew a, blew a, a keg while we were trying to do the, the tasting. So we had to rejigger the whole tasting um, in the middle of the, in the middle of the prep. So that was a bummer. But, um, and then the other time I did it was at Worthy over in Bend. And I really enjoy doing these when you can highlight the beers in a single brewery. It's really, it's really cool. So th anyway, those are the two times we've done it before. What I didn't have for those is this awesome panel. Um, you know, it's just me and a bunch of people in the room, which was great. But I love having these guys. They're awesome. You guys all nailed it. Cool. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> and I, I think I think we're ready to take this on the road. I'd, I'd, I'd love to. I'd love to do this in person with this panel. It would be so cool. It would be. It would be a, probably a much different uh, experience because um, from from the beer perspective one of the things that i love about beer panels is uh, audience participation and one of the, i don't know if you've noticed one of the hardest things i've uh, had to deal with in this format is not getting that feedback from people who are also drinking because um you know even though uh, we're considered the experts when i do classes like this i learn so much I, you know, I really, I get new vocabulary, um, man, pencil shavings, like, yeah, that is what that is, <laughs> you know, um, I never would have come up on that on my own, so. They're saying to do it in Belgium and Maine, maybe some other <laughs> places, so. Someone just are, mentioned are, are GABF. Pa pa panelists, are you ready to go to Belgium with me? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're going to do it. We're going to, it's going to be a, it's going to be a bicycle tour. Okay. Oh, and, Perfect. Caitlin, do you think the U of O Alumni Association can set up something for this? Maybe, maybe with travel prices right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the restrictions might be problematic. Yeah, you might not get to come back. <laughs> oh yeah. Er. I agree with you there, though, Dana. Our palettes are also different, and even just like the fact that. For all of you who aren't in Eugene right now, um, the allergies <laughs> right now, like I've been trying to keep my passages open so that I can actually get a clear taste and um, aroma of beer. So yeah, it's nice to hear what other people have to say um, in a more interactive format, but this definitely works for our current situation. <laughs> um. This is awesome. I have so many questions. Like, I'm, we're at the end of this thing. I'm like, but I want to ask. Anyway. Uh, there is one question we didn't answer about steam beer. Um, steam beer, is John still around? Um, steam beer is a lager beer that has been fermented at ale, t ale yeast temperatures. So generally, lagers are fermented a little colder than ale yeast. Um, and so if you take that ale yeast and you ferment it at a warmer temperature, you're going to get a different expression of the flavors from that yeast. And the reason it's called a steam beer is because it's so warm that it's releasing this steam that um, generally isn't associated with lager beers. Um, I, I, I think it's m at this point more of sort of a, um, I, I don't know, like a... It's a, it's a California novelty. Novelty, that's the word I'm looking for. It's more of a novelty aspect um, than, than it is uh, like a super uh, nuanced style. Um, a Kolsch, it could be also brewed in the style of a steam beer. 
If you drink an Anchor Steam in a lineup with a bunch of lagers, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Because it tastes like an ale, right? It, it tastes... It tastes worse than an ale. Yeah. As you expect. I think, so. that's your, I think that's your bias, man. Yeah. It's impossible. A, it's subjective like a, truth. It's like, um, you know, it's, it's like it's, it's what you would buy in the San Francisco airport. You'd buy sa some sourdough bread and a, and a sixer of Anchor Steam. So, John, I meant uh, novelty is in at this point. There's, I mean, to call it a steam beer is, is sort of, um, you're grabbing onto that marketing term. It's um, not necessarily special at this point. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that feels so mean. <laughs> you're not special steam beer. Uh, Viking Bragger, uh, they don't just use uh, malt to uh, brew their beer, they use honey. Um, so when you take different sugars from different raw materials, you create a different alcoholic beverage, right? We take potatoes and we ferment them, vodka. You take grain and ferment it, beer. You take apples and ferment it, cider. Uh, you take honey and you ferment it, that's a mead. But if you take malt and honey, that's a braggart. So um, what's really cool is if you want to support Viking Bragger here in Eugene, Oregon, uh, they get all their honey within 100 miles. So that's, that's really awesome. Did that answer your question, Leland? Okay, cool. Anyone else absolutely faded right now? I see people are starting to stack their beer cans to the ceiling. Really? <laughs> Pretty dang cool. <laughs> nice job, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> Next row tower. Nice. We should see who can get the, the highest stack. I have a lot in my, um, from our practice runs, I have a lot here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just don't Absolutely. knock them over onto the laptop. That's Absolute a bad thing. Absolute all-time favorite beer panel. Mark, why don't you start us off? Oh, geez. Absolute all-time favorite beer. <laughs> no pressure. Wait, yeah. <laughs> Boom. Do, do, Mark, do, Mark, do you need time? Do you need time? Yeah, I, I might need some uh, time to think about that. So D Dana, Augustiner Brow. Do you know that one? Uh, that's a, a true Belgian, isn't it? No, it's a Hellas that comes out of um, Austria. Awesome. Augustiner Brau. Um, we actually went to the brewery because I couldn't not go when we were in that region. But it's, it's an amazing, amazing lager with the most clean but complex palate. Unbelievable. Highly recommended. Is it making your mouth water? Thinking mm -hmm. about it? <laughs> As you drink the espresso stout? No, no, no. I'm, I'm drinking the amber. But... <laughs> <laughs> not the same, not the same at all. I want the amber to be on nitro so bad. <laughs> mm. oh, yeah. Um, for okay, me, Mark, you had your time. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I'm, I'm still stewing over it. I mean, okay, I'm gonna take a, uh, a, do a slight dodge here. Some of it's contextual. Like, so I, you know, we talked about this last week with the espresso stout. I hadn't had a like an espresso stout in forever. And was like, ah, I had forgotten. This is great. But now it's getting warm out. I'm like, ah, eh, you know, maybe not. Um, I I gotta say, and the, the others will probably poo-poo this, but I like English ales. Like those, like a lot of those mild ales um, are just. I, there's just something about them that's just really nice. Um, that uh, I don't know. Um, but I don't get them. I don't get the source Pilsner thing that you had, Hutch which would be really, really great. Yeah. You know. um, for me, uh, my white whale is the stoic uh, Belgian quad from Deschutes. Mm. Um, a couple of years back, they came out with not the stoic. And that was well labeled. Um, <laughs> uh, so that's, that's my, my favorite beer of all time. Nice. Uh, I, so I have to agree 
that with Mark that so much of um, my favorite beers are tied to contacts. <laughs> and so I don't know if the um, Colorado folks are still on here, but I have very fond memories of my first time visiting Crooked Stave in Denver and oh, having their wild sage sour. It was like life changing experience to have a flight from there. And so um, I just really, um, I guess so much of what we taste in beer comes along. I see Lindy laughing hysterically on my screen right now. And I'm like, is she laughing at me? Um, but yeah, I just, maybe it's the arts person in me, but um, it's experiential, right? So there's all the things around your first time having that beer that make it really special. And yeah. for me, that what comes to mind is that crooked stave and going to the source in Denver and everything around you and going into their tasting room and trying the those sours for the first time it was like yeah. nice. I've had one or two magical Rainiers I gotta say <laughs> um, <just> gonna... <laughs> oh, Schlitz malt liquor I just have to say back when Rainier had the pounder bottles oh that was like there was a, such a beautiful packaging to that pound, pounder with the twist off it, yeah come on Bring it back. Yeah. <laughs> we're we're going to bring it back to the question. Yeah, maybe beer, beer. <laughs> you know, the, the cans with B-E-E-R on it. <laughs> uh, Hutch, you alluded to this, but the water chemistry matters a lot. Could the panel comment on relevant water chemistry in Oregon and in beer styles? What needs to be added or removed from, say, Eugene or Bend water? Well, Eugene water is super soft mm -hmm. compared to many people's water. It's great, you know, like if you're trying to brew something that's, um, you know, if you're trying to brew something that mimics like a lager or a pilsner or something very light, then we actually have great water for that. Um, as we start to, you know, to do a little more darker beers, those tend to require, you know, water additions that are different. But I think generally, if you're trying to replicate a style, figuring out what the water chemistry is at that site and then matching that is what's important. Yeah. So, um, you know, again, I mean, what, what, what's awesome for us is we don't have much in our water. So, so you can add, add things, things to, to it. it. Uh-oh, somebody's... Yeah, um, so anyway, we, we can add to our water to make it like a lot of other styles. Whereas there's a bunch of, you know, people that have harder water out in the world. You know, it's harder to subtract things from the water than it is to add things. Yeah. 